I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the world. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. I invite you to join in reading a portion of Psalm 62 appointed for this day. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. Truly, my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my safety and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in him always, O people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the scales, they are lighter than a breath, all of them together. Put no trust in extortion, in robbery, take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice I have heard it, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love is yours, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to his deeds. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen.
a reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God.
A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Now after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. We could probably shrug off this statement. Had it not been said by a disciple of Christ who himself was martyred. This was a statement made by the 20th century theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his influential work, The Cost of Discipleship. And about eight years after he wrote this statement, Bonhoeffer, a German citizen, was put to death by the Nazi party at the young age of 39. In retrospect, it's it's really not hard to hear these words as a man's prophetic prediction of his own execution. As a man so well aware of the fate of the early apostles and the great line of biblical prophets, Bonhoeffer would have known quite well where Christ was leading him. A man like him, a man who just would not sit by quietly while the Nazi regime buddied up to the church and its officials. A man like this knew quite well what the cost of his discipleship would be. But he also knew that the call that Christ was leading him to was not one that he could deny. It's also not very hard to see the parallels between this Christian disciple, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and the one who just about 20 years later was martyred at the same young age of 39, Martin Luther King Jr. One could not mistake the same prophetic knowledge that King was noted to have Uh, been so aware of in his last speech ever. Because in this speech, King was noted to have said that God had taken him, like Moses, to the top of the mountain and shown him a promised land that he would not inherit. King was noted to have said that longevity of life has its place, but it was no longer of concern to him. Both of these men knew quite well that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Now Bonhoeffer is quite clear that not all women and men will be called into a death like his or like kings or even the first and early disciples. Some of them will be called into a death that looks much more like twists and turns of vocation and self-denial and self-emptying. But he is clear that all who hear the call of Christ and obey that call will experience some iteration of that same death, a death to self in Jesus Christ, a death that raises us up into a new way of life, life in the fullness of reality, life as it was intended to be. Nonetheless, The statement that discipleship is an invitation to die is not really a word of encouragement 
that one might want to use for the sake of evangelization. And perhaps it should not be used to that end. Because put into the wrong hands, these become dangerous words. This is a statement that is both off-putting to those who do not believe Christ. And it is a weapon for those who do not obey Christ. Put into the wrong hands, a statement that says a person must die for Christ can lead self-guided men and women to commit all sorts of heinous acts under the banner of Christ. And that is not discipleship. That is not following. And that is certainly not obedience. But then again, obedience to Christ is really not so easy to identify. While it doesn't really take much effort to to see how violence committed in the name of Christ is a far cry from discipleship, it is quite difficult at times to see how outwardly loving and selfless acts may not be marks of discipleship. Because discipleship is not properly understood about good Christian behavior and acts of charity. We can leave our our metaphoric fishing nets behind. We could abandon friend and family for the sake of a higher calling or moral good. But if it's not truly a call from Christ, then even an outwardly righteous act will be merely another act of self-fulfillment. We cannot plot out our own path of discipleship. Discipleship is a journey of following, and we cannot follow by leading God in negotiation. We cannot tell God what we're willing to abandon for his sake. It is simply demanded of us, and we are called to obey. It is entirely possible that the cost of discipleship may not involve abandoning occupation, We're leaving possessions behind and and family, such was the case for Simon, Andrew, James, and John. The great mystery really is that, that each of us will not be asked to follow in the same manner. However, the the call of discipleship is such that at any moment, if it were demanded of us, we would be ready to abandon all things in order to obey Christ and come and follow. At all times, the life of discipleship is this great paradox of spiritual indifference that Paul suggests. We must live with our spouses as if we had no spouse. Live with our possessions as if we had no possessions. And live in the world as if we had no dealings with the world. When Christ calls us to give such things up, such things as these up for him, We're not made righteous for doing so. We're merely being invited. Invited into a place where being a disciple is uniquely possible for us. Christ calls us to die to ourselves. Die to the part of ourselves that that we so often wish to cling to most dearly. He calls us to do so in order that we might live to him. In this way, discipleship is not really another point on life's continuum. It's not a fulfillment. It's not a clarification or addition to our old life. It is an entirely new life. In whatever manner each of us might be called to follow Christ as disciples, as spouse or parent or child or as fishermen, as businessmen or clergymen, and sometimes even in rare flashes of history as prophet and martyr. In any of these cases, the death we experience and the one who calls us into it and the one whose life we are raised to share will always be the same.
please join me in reaffirming our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your city help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Look in compassion, O Heavenly Father, upon this troubled and divided world. Though we cannot trace your footsteps or understand your working, give us grace to trust you now with an understanding, faith, and when your own time is come, reveal, O Lord, your new heaven and new earth, where righteousness dwells and where the Prince of Peace rules, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Stir us up to offer to you, O Lord, our bodies, our souls, our spirits, in all we love and all we learn, in all we plan and all we do, to offer our labors, our pleasures, our sorrows to you, to work through them for your kingdom, to live as those who are not their own, but bought with your blood. Grant, O oh Lord, that we may wait anxiously as servants standing in your presence for the least hint of your will, that we may become all truth under whatever outward forms it may be revealed to us, that we may have grace, recognizing that your ways are not our ways, nor your thoughts like our thoughts, that we may bless every good deed by whomever it may be done, that we may rise above all petty strife and cries to the contemplation of your eternal truth and goodness. O oh God Almighty, who never changes, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Give your grace, we pray, to all who are called to the office of ministry. Fill them with the truth of your doctrine and clothe them with holiness of life, that they may faithfully serve before you. We celebrate the anniversary of the ordination of the Reverend Michael Pamasana. We pray that your compassion may be delivered to those who are neglected, weary, and sorrowing and that your grace may be present to those who are sick, remembering especially Lucy, John, Karen, Charlotte, Glenn, Colleen, Sean, Beverly, Gerd, Jeffrey, Joan, Yvonne, Stephanie, and Rebecca. Give rest and peace to the dead and bring us all to your eternal kingdom. Remember especially J. Rodman Steele Jr. and Nicholas Lowe Castro. Please join me in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray. Give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen.
Good morning. A couple of uh, important announcements this morning. First of all, we are most delighted to have a special guest as the leader of our adult forum today. It's David Thornburg, who is the president of um, the Committee of 70, which is um, a group of people centered around the values of community organization and civic leadership. I can think of few topics that are as timely or as important for us to be informed about. And I think that um, his work will be profoundly uh, beneficial to our understanding of how we can best act uh, corporately at this time. So I truly hope that many of you will choose to be part of that um, conversation this morning. Uh, once again, you um, can find the Zoom link on our calendar um, at 11 o'clock for that adult forum. Um, also the following week, we are um, very pleased that uh, the Reverend Dr. Charles Howard from the University of Pennsylvania, the chaplain there will be with us. Uh, Chaz is an Episcopal priest and has um, played a very important role in the city community through the last year. And I think that he can uh, bring us uh, much insight into what is happening there. So. I hope that you can also put that on your calendar. On February 7, we will have our annual meeting and uh, we of course hope that you will be with us on that day. We are gonna try to bring you some uh, really good images of everything that's happening in the interior of the uh, new parish house. We hope at that point to be substantially finished with construction and uh, have a certificate of occupancy so that we can start the next phase, which is it moving in all of the appointments and furniture, et cetera, uh, which will take a number of weeks to actually complete. Uh, but we hope to bring that to you. We will be electing new uh, vestry members, and then we will be looking at what 2021 may portend for all of us here at Church of the Redeemer. So an important day for all of us. Uh, finally, let me say uh, along a similar line that um, there are so many wonderful uh, photographs uh, put on our website uh, that show what's happening inside the building. And uh, it's, it's an amazing space for us to be able to think about living into and living out of and inviting the community in and making it a, a, an incredible asset for the church and for the broader community. If you look at those photographs, you'll begin to get a sense of what we together have brought about. And that should be something of great joy, even at this time when, because of various restrictions, we can't inhabit that building fully. But we will get there, and it will be a great blessing for generations to come. So uh, think about, in a spare moment, clicking on our website, just looking through those photographs. You won't be sorry you did.